Good afternoon, everyone. It's good to see you all here pre-social distancing. Got no idea what it's going to happen, but I took the opportunity this morning to lay on the bed in the cabin and hone my skills at I Spy With My Little Eye, just in case. Got to say that Lee didn't find it anywhere near as fascinating than I thought she was going to, but anyway. Um, and I also thought that a lot of you might be um, off booked in for a scan this afternoon. Does everyone know what a scan is? A few blank faces. A scan is the acronym for Senior Citizens Afternoon Nap. <laughs> Apparently, the, um, the thought police have decided that uh, Nana Nap is no longer suitable because it's too gender specific, so they've come up with this. So I just hope that uh, none of you feel the need for a scan over the next 45 minutes. <laughs> so um, when I first introduced myself uh, last week when we first got on board, I mentioned that. Um, um, three years ago, Lee and I retired and we bought this boat in Southampton in, in England and cruised it across the Channel to, to Europe and we spent about five months each year cruising around uh, the rivers and the canals on that and then in October we put it into hibernation and then we go cruising around the world on beautiful cruise ships giving speaking presentations. So it's been absolutely fantastic and um, our friends say to us, you're living the dream, and we say, well, no, we're not, because we would never have dared to dream that something like this would ever have happened. But, uh, and it's been, so it's been great, and uh, a lot of people have come up over the last uh, 10 days and asked, how did it all come about? And I've got to say that it almost didn't. Um, we were living on the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, which is a beautiful place. It's a uh, vibrant but laid-back coastal community. Um, it's people aspire to go and live on the Sunshine Coast, and we had it very good. We could walk through our, our back fence, every, our gate every morning, through a, a park down to the beach and walk along the beach, so it was great. But, but we had been bitten by the travel bug, and back in 2009, we had the opportunity to go to the Burgundy region of France and um, cruise around on a 10-metre boat for two weeks over there. And while we were there, we met a lot of Brits and Kiwis and Aussies who do that every year, spend six months on their boat and then six months back home. And we'd never seen, we'd never heard of this. But we thought, what a great idea. This is a fantastic retirement. So we started working towards that. And then the middle of um, 2016, some issues all conspired to come together at the one time, issues with my health and with Lee's um, job. And we lost a few friends to cancer way too early and a few other things. And it made me reassess things and, and look at our circumstances. And when I did, I thought, you know, if we were careful, we could and we really should do this now while we still can. Um, and what Lee came home from work one day and I said to her, let's retire. Let's retire now, buy a boat and go cruising around Europe. And she was a little bit surprised. Um, shocked, comatosic shocked is probably a better description of how she felt because this was a full eight years before we were due to retire. And um, she would admit, she's much better now, but she would admit that she's not the most positive person in the world. Um, her, she's always been the devil's advocate in our relationship. So it's usually me that comes up with the idea or the plan, and her role in our relationship is to test that idea by asking what we refer to as but what if questions. And in this case, she had a lot of but, but what if questions. You know, but what if we get there, we don't like it, but what if we run out of money, but what about visas, but what about health insurance, but what if the boat's too small, but what if the boat's too big, but what if the world really is flat and we fail off the damn thing? <laughs> All these types of things and a lot more. And um, so over the next few months, we started working through those questions and resolving them. And I thought we were doing pretty well. I knew Lee was still very nervous about the whole thing. I didn't really understand why. I think I'm a very empathetic sort of person, but and to me, all we were really doing was retiring from good, secure, well-paid jobs that we thought we loved. <laughs> we were going to rent out our home, that, a, a house that had been our home for more than 20 years. We were going to sell or give away all of our worldly possessions. We weren't going to put anything in the storage. We were going to say farewell to a wonderful network of family and great friends. Uh, leave the country with just one suitcase each, travel to the far side of the world where we didn't know a soul, to live on a small boat which we'd never done before and have no fixed address for an indeterminate period of time. What could possibly go wrong? I mean, <laughs> what's there to worry about? But she was concerned and we got to the stage where it was around about October, we thought we resolved the issues, we um, had told family and a few friends what we planned to do but we hadn't said anything official. 
And one Sunday evening, we went down to one of our favourite places on the Sunshine Coast, which is a bay overlooking this sort of view, and to have a, a celebratory deep because the following day we were going to do it. We were going to um, put in our letters of resignation and put a deposit on the boat. And um, Lee was a bit quiet, a bit pensive that evening, and uh, so being the wonderful, supportive, sensitive husband that I am, I gave her some space. And then eventually she turned around and she put her hand on my uh, forearm like this, which, gentlemen, is international code for I want to have a serious conversation with you. <laughs> and she said... I'll never forget, she said, um, you know I love the idea of cruising around Europe on our own boat, but I really love living on the Sunshine Coast. And I thought, oh, no. I was devastated. My heart just sank. I thought, after all these years of dreaming about this, after all these months of working towards this, um, she was going to let her fears of the unknown uh, cloud her judgment, and she was going to pull out. She was going to get cold feet at the 11th hour, and, and it was all over. But being the problem-solving genius that I am, I turned to her and I said, no problems, what we'll do is we'll rename the boat Sunshine Coast so you can have the best of both worlds. <laughs> you can cruise around Europe on your own boat and you can still live on the Sunshine Coast. And she stared at me with, her mouth was moving but she, no words were coming out. <laughs> but it didn't matter because I knew exactly what she was thinking. She was thinking, what a lucky girl I am. That solves everything. And that's exactly what we did. We changed the name of the boat to the Sunshine Coast. So, absolutely true story. And um, so, we, we didn't let, I'm proud of her because she didn't let her fears um, interfering with her going off and becoming, uh, having great adventures and great experiences. And which is a good segue into what we're going to talk about today, which is Vasco da Gama. Now, usually when I do a presentation, I speak about people and events or, or things that are lesser known. Um, and people that have become heroes of mine. But in the case of Vasco da Gama, it's a bit different. He is very well known, and as you'll find as we go through this, he wasn't the nicest explorer that ever walked the earth. But to understand more about that era, you have to understand the age, the, the Portuguese age of discovery. And this was all started by a man by the name of Henry the Navigator, Prince Henry. He was the, um, the third son and the fourth child of King John of uh, Portugal and Queen Philippa, who was the sister of um, King, Henry the, uh, King Henry IV of England. And he knew he was never going to accede to the throne of Portugal, and he wanted to create a role and a legacy for himself. So he uh, and his wife resigned as senior members of the royal family, and they went off to live in Canada, although... Canada hadn't been discovered by the Europeans at that stage. I could be getting that mixed up with someone else. Hang on a second. We'll go back. Prince Henry, not the other one, Prince Henry, wanted a role for himself. And uh, at the age of 21, he was given command by his father of a force that was going to take on the Barbary pirates of Morocco. Now, they controlled the, um, that gap, that choke point uh, at the Straits of Gibraltar, between Gibraltar and the um, coast of North Africa. And they would force every vessel that go, went through that point to pay a tribute, which cost a lot of money for Portuguese and Spanish vessels. But they also um, raided along the Spanish and Portuguese coasts, and they caused a lot of damage. They attacked whole villages and murdered, raped, robbed, and kidnapped people and took them back to North Africa and sold them into the white slave trade. So uh, something had to be done. So Prince Henry led a raid on the Barbary pirates and destroyed much of their power for the next hundred years, which meant that now the Portuguese could control that choke point. Now he went on to be able to, now the Barbary, Barbary pirates were out of the way, weren't a big concern, he was able to send uh, fleets down that Western African coast, uh, searching for trading opportunities. And these became very, very affluent. They brought back gold and silver and slaves, and over a period of time, Portugal and Prince Henry himself became very, very rich. And because of his efforts, um, Portugal became a maritime superpower, even though they had a very small population at the time. One of his other legacies is that he created navigational schools. Now, some of the greatest explorers in history, including uh, da Gama, Magellan, uh, Diaz, 
uh, Albuquerque, all these Portuguese explorers went to these navigational skills and they learnt their skills there in celestial navigation, uh, in cartography or the drawing of maps, uh, seamanship, gunnery, but also language skills and business skills, accounting skills and things like that. Uh, Prince uh, Henry, Henry the Navigator, went on to become the Grand Master of the Military Order of Christ, which is the, um, the Portuguese version of the, the Knights Templar. And he's also responsible for a lot of innovation and ship design. And he designed this caravel type of vessel, which was faster, bigger, lighter, and could travel further than any other vessel of its time. And because of the, um, the triangular-shaped sails, which could be moved from side to side, like a yacht is able to do these days, it was able to beat into the wind, effectively sail into the wind, which was innovative for its time. Now, in 1488, Bartholomew Diaz was ordered to sail down that west coast of Africa. At the time, there was certainly a trade route to, from Europe all the way through to uh, India, and this was a very, very profitable trade route. But it was controlled by the merchants in Venice, and they weren't giving any of that up to anyone else. And so perhaps there was a better way of getting there. A lot of people in Europe at the time thought that the Indian Ocean, where we are right now, uh, was a huge inland sea, similar to the Black Sea and the Red Sea and things like that. This was just an inland sea and there was no way to get into it. But Diaz was ordered to go down, as far down that African coast as possible to see whether there was an end to this great continent. So he hugged the coast as he sailed down the coast and when he got uh, far, uh, far south, um, he found that the winds, the, the prevailing winds, were too strong to go any further. He couldn't get any further south, no matter what he did. So he turned to the west and sailed out into the mil, middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and there he picked up trade winds, which were going to propel him south, east, um, down. So when he went down to the, um, the southern, past the southern uh, tip of Africa, he was able to turn uh, to the, the uh, east, and cruise along there, out of sight. He didn't see what we now know as the Cape of Good Hope. And then he turned north again, and then he beat back towards the coast. And he landed at a place that we now know as Mersel Bay in South Africa, along that eastern Cape coast. And while he, when he arrived there, he erected a stone cross and claimed this land for Portugal. It was going to be theirs. And if you ever go to Mersel Bay, um, there's a wonderful Bartholomew Diaz Maritime Museum there, uh, they've got a replica of the stone cross that he, he erected. You can go out just near the, um, the, the uh, museum and see where the stone cross was actually erected. And the, but the coolest thing there is this um, life-size, this, this exact replica of the vessel that he took on this journey. And it would easily fit on the stage. It wasn't a big vessel at all. And you can clamber over it and just see how small this, this ship was. And you'd have to marvel at the bravery of these people back in those days who would travel into the unknown like that on a vessel that sort of size. Just incredible. So um, he wanted to keep going further, but his men refused. They'd had enough. This was, this was already going way, way outside their comfort zone. So uh, he had no choice but to turn around and head back towards Portugal. And on the way back, he hugged that coast, that uh, w eastern coast of South Africa, and he was actually able to see the coastline as he went around what was known as the Cape of, we know now as the Cape of uh, Good Hope. But he named that Cape, Cape of Storms, because of the prevailing winds and weather uh, in that location. Just hope we don't have to go through that. It wasn't until he got back to Portugal um, and King John II uh, said to him, no, we don't want that name, it's too negative. And he, King John changed the name to the Cape of Good Hope because it represented a new trading route, a new fantastic opportunity for the Portuguese. Um, when he got back, he realised that, um, Diaz realised that the ships that he had were too small. They needed to be better sized ships to be able to handle that weather going around the Cape. So he helped design a brand new class of ship and the first two of these were called the Sao Gabriel and the Sao Rafael and the Gama was going to take these vessels on his voyage. Now, at the time, um, these were the two great Catholic superpowers of the world. And Pope Alexander VI decided that he didn't want any rivalry between his two great Catholic superpowers. Co uh, pope Alexander VI, by the way, was a fairly controversial pope. He was um, 
proud of the fact that he had fathered several children to several of his mistresses who actually lived at the Vatican with him. So very un unorthodox sort of pope. But he organized the Treaty of Tordesillas, which was to split the world between Portugal and Spain. And he used the, the line of, uh, of latitude that uh, Columbus had, um, where Columbus had discovered the new world of the Americas. And that was going to be the point. Anything to the west of that was going to belong to, or going to be controlled by the Spanish. And anything to the east of that was going to be the, um, uh, be controlled by the Portuguese and be their domain. Now, Vasco da Gama himself was born around about 1460 in the Portuguese city of Senez. Uh, he was the third of five sons to a uh, knight of the, the Portuguese court, a very well-connected, wealthy family. Um, and on the 8th of July, 1497, he took four ships and 170 men on this great voyage. It was going to follow up, all it was going to do was follow up the work of Diaz and just explore more of that coastline. That, um, that eastern coastline of Africa. That was his mission. He took the Sail Gabriel, which was uh, a length of 27 metres, so once again, this would fit quite comfortably uh, in this auditorium. Um, the San Rafael, which was going to be skippered by his brother Paulo. Uh, a smaller ship, a Carrick, um, which was um, known as the Berrio, and a, also a store ship. And instead of hugging that, uh, that western coastline of Africa as he went down the coast, he did... Uh, he just went straight out from the middle of the Atlantic Ocean to try and pick up those trade winds that Diaz had found. And when he found them, they propelled him all the way south, just like they had with Diaz, and around that cape, out of sight of the Cape of Good Hope. And once again, he arrived in Mosul Bay in South Africa. Now, that 10,000 kilometre or 6,000 nautical mile journey was at that time the longest period that anyone had ever spent out of sight of land. When they got to Mosul Bay, they distributed the, sh the other stores that were left on the store ship amongst the other ships. They distributed the crews amongst them as well, and they burnt that store ship. And then he headed north, and he passed the point that Diaz had got to. So he was now traveling into the unknown. No one had ever been there before. Along the uh, Christmas day in uh, 1497, they were cruising along the coast of what we now know as South Africa, and he named that coastline Natal, which means the birth of Christ. And then he arrived in what we now know as Durban. And off the coast of Durban, he found very, very good fishing and he was able to reposition his vessel. But then a storm came up and pushed all the, the ships out to sea. And when they came back to land again, they uh, arrived at Mozambique. They were the very first Europeans to uh, travel to Mozambique and they stayed there between the 2nd and the 29th of, of March of that year. They didn't... The Gama didn't really know how Christians would be treated when they arrived here. So he decided that uh, he would impersonate being a Muslim, and they told all these men that we need to impersonate being Muslims. The local um, emir wasn't very happy with these guys because they hadn't bought any suitable trade gifts or any suitable gifts. Because back in those days, it was traditional um, that if you arrived somewhere, you would present a, a gift, of, gift of great value to the local emir and they hadn't taken anything of that sort. When, um, when they arrived, they found that there was two men, two marine pilots, two marine guides, who talked about the fact that they could guide ships to India. And the Gama got the idea, I could go all the way to India, but didn't realise I could do this. So he kidnapped those, marine, those two marine pilots and kept them on board. Now, it wasn't long before the, uh, the locals cottoned on that these guys weren't Muslims. They didn't observe the, the daily prayers, the call to prayers. Uh, they didn't act like Muslims. They didn't know the Muslim traditions. And some of the men became, uh, took advantages of some of the, the local women. So they upset the locals. And there was a riot. Um, the Gamma and his men were chased back to their ships and only just made it back um, in, to save their lives. So in retaliation, the Gamma turned his cannons onto this undefended city, and he bombarded the city for six hours, causing lots of damage and, and lots of deaths. He then sailed on into the Indian Ocean, and he resorted to piracy. So any Muslim ship he would come across, he would attack, he would take all their cargo to replenish his own supplies, and if there was any resistance, he would kill the people on board. He arrived at Mombasa, and was 
given a very good welcome. The, the, the local sultan of Mombasa sent out live sheep that he could slaughter and, and eat. He sent uh, uh, some vegetables and some fruit uh, out to the ships, uh, which was very, very welcome. He sent some emissaries to the ships and he invited De Gama and his men to come ashore for a great feast. And while he was there, one of those marine pilots that he'd kidnapped escaped. And De Gama smelled a rat. He thought something was wrong. Something just wasn't uh, quite right. So he took some of these, um, these emissaries that uh, had been sent out to the ships and he tortured them by placing their hands into boiling oil. And until they, they um, broke and they, were, they told De Gama, yet, yes, this was in fact a trap. The, um, the, the mayor of, of, um, of Mozambique and the sultan of, of Mombasa were actually, friends actually related. And they, um, Mombasa had heard about what had happened in Mozambique and he wanted to bring the um, um, De Gama ashore so he could massacre him and his men. So once again, De Gama was outraged. He turned his guns onto the, the city of uh, Mombasa as well and bombarded that city before heading off. And then he used the pilots and he sailed all the way across to Calicut in India, which was a great feat. This was the first European to, to sail to, to the continent, the subcontinent of India, and a tr tremendous feat. And when he got there on second, the 20th of May, uh, 1498, he met the, the um, Zamorin of Calicut. Now, a Zamorin is like a king or a sultan, that sort of, sort of level. And the Zamorin was very happy to see these Europeans and it opened up another trading opportunity for him. And he organised a grand parade for De Gama where uh, more than 3,000 of the Zamorin's own personal guard marched by in honour of, of De Gama. Um, but once again, the Zamorin was upset that De Gama hadn't really bought any trade goods or any gifts uh, for him. Uh, De Gama was only able to get together a few cloaks and hats and some uh, barrels of honey and sugar and oil, which had fingerprints in it from the, um, from the torture uh, before. And he, um, he categorically denied these Christians the opportunity for exclusive rights to trade, which was what um, De Gama wanted. In fact, he told De Gama, you'll be trading just like any other trader, just like these Muslim traders that come over from, from the Far East through, um, uh, through uh, Venice and everything. You'll have to trade on the same uh, terms as them. And in fact, uh, if you want to bring goods for trade here, you will have to pay a customs duty in gold, just like everyone else has to. Now, De Gama didn't really like this idea. He thought that they were Europeans, they were Portuguese, they were Christians, they were the followers of the one true faith why do these barbarians not treat us with more respect? But um, he was able to fill his vessels with spices and while he was there, the other marine pilot had escaped as well. So he kidnapped some local fishermen to guide him back to the, uh, the coast of Africa. And against the advice of those fishermen and everyone else, he took off uh, to head back to Portugal. The advice was don't go at this stage of the year because this is the time of year when the monsoon winds, the prevailing monsoon winds would be against him during this voyage. And while it had only taken him 23 days to go from um, the coast of Africa to um, Calicut, it was going to take him 132 days to sail back against those winds, those monsoon winds. And in doing so, he lost 30 of his men to disease, which was a disaster. He, uh, he arrived back on the coast at Malindi, on the 7th of January, 1499, and once again, he erected a stone cross claiming that land for Portugal. By this time, because of the sickness on board and the loss of those 30 men, there wasn't enough men to crew these three ships, so he distributed the men amongst um, the other two ships and burnt the San Rafael. He went down the coast of Africa again, and once again, he passed around the Cape of Good Hope and arrived in the Azores, and by that time, his brother Paolo was very ill indeed, so... De Gama sent his ships on and he stayed with uh, Polo in the Azores until Polo uh, succumbed to his illness and died. And he arrived, De Gama arrived back in Lisbon on the 29th of August, 1499, and received an absolute hero's welcome. He'd gone much further and done a lot more than anyone had ever expected him to do. He'd found a route to, a sea route to India. And even though he'd lost two of his four ships, and of the 170 men, only 44 returned alive. It was considered a great, uh, a great success, this mission. In fact, 
the spices that he'd brought back on those two ships were enough to, to um, the, there were 60 times more the value of mounting the expedition in the first place. So a huge profit uh, was, uh, was brought on. He also brought back um, some china dinner sets, some porcelain dinner sets, and gave these as gifts to royalty and to, um, to other uh, VIPs and dignitaries, and these were a massive hit for him. So he was, um, a new role, a new title was created in his honour, and he was made Admiral of the Indian Sea and a Dom, or a Lord in perpetuity, so which would pass down uh, through his family over the years. Now, just on the value of these spices, if you take pepper, for example, which is just a very, very basic spice, it wasn't one of the more exotic spices, you could buy pepper in Kelly Cut for 4.64 uh, ducats. When you sold it in Alexandra in Egypt, you could get 25 ducats for it. Uh, when it was sold to the merchants in Venice who had the monopoly on all this trade, uh, they paid 56 ducats for it. And then it was sold on to Lisbon for 80 ducats, and that was before it was sold on to the public. So this is already 17 times the value of what it was originally purchased for. So if you cut out all those middlemen, you can make an even greater fortune, which is exactly what the Portuguese had in mind. In 1500, uh, another great explorer, uh, Pedro Cabral, was given command of the second Indian uh, Armada. And his, his brief, his mission was to go and create a trading treaty with the Zamorin of Calicut and establish a trading factory or a trading, a trading warehouse in that city which could uh, collect spices all year round and the Portuguese could go along and, and uh, have these spices delivered back to Portugal. So he left with 13 ships, 1,500 men, and learning from what had happened with de Gama, he took along some very valuable gifts uh, for the Zamorin, uh, uh, to please the Zamorin. He, he once again sailed out into the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, but he went even further uh, to the west, and he bumped into some land. He also, sorry, took on some Christian missionaries as well. And he bumped into this land, which we now know as Brazil. He thought it was an island, so he named it the Island of the True Cross. And it was only later on when it was discovered that it was part of the South American continent that the name was changed to Land of the Holy Cross, and we now know it as Brazil. But he realised that this land was to the east of the Treaty of Tordesillas, so he could claim this for Portugal, and they could have an, establish a, a, another trading post in South America. And in uh, doing this journey, he became the, um, the very first person to sail to four continents, Europe, South America, Asia, and Africa. On the 26th of April, uh, 1500, which was Easter Sunday, his, his Franciscan friars went ashore and they celebrated the very first Christian mash, mass in either South America or North America. And it was seen by all these Indians at the time. Now, he sent one of his ships back from Brazil, back to uh, Portugal to let the king know that he discovered this new land. And then he took his other 12 ships and he sailed for India. When he got to the Cape of Good Hope, a huge storm came up and six of his ships were sunk, including a ship that was commanded by Bartholomew Diaz, the man, ironically, who had named this place the Cape of Storms. His ship went down with all hands. But they arrived in Calicut on the 13th of September, 1500, only to find that the old Zamorin had died and a new, younger Zamorin had taken his place, a Zamorin who was now very keen to establish trading links with the Europeans. So they signed a trading treaty and the Zamorin gave them permission to es establish a trading factory or warehouse on, on the docks. And this was a huge warehouse that could take a, a, get as many spices as possible. Uh, so things were looking up for the Portuguese. But after a, a couple of months, the, uh, the head of the trading factory came to Cabral and he complained that he, they weren't getting preferential treatment. In fact, the, uh, the Muslim traders who had been trading with these people for decades, for years, for centuries, uh, were getting, seemed to be getting much better treatment than they were. So Cabral went to the Zamorin to complain and asked for special treatment, and he was told no. I mean, why would we give you special treatment? If you want more spices, you'll have to pay extra for them, just like a normal trading um, uh, person would normally do. So Cabral wasn't happy with that. 
And he raided one of the Muslim ships in the harbour that was being loaded and he stole all their cargo and took it on to one of his ships. Now, when the local Muslim traders found out about this, the Muslim merchant, they were very angry and they organised a riot uh, to go through the city and thousands of people rioted uh, in protest against these, these Europeans and they went into the trading factory. They killed 70 of the Portuguese and they burnt down the trading factory. And 20 of the, the, um, the traders were able to escape by swimming out to the ships and they told Cabral what had happened. And they also said that some of the Zamorin's own men had stood by watching the massacre happen, watching these 70 men be massacred. So once again, Cabral was, was furious. He boarded 10 Muslim ships in the harbour. He killed every man aboard there. He took all their cargoes and he burnt the ships. And then he turned his guns onto this defenceless city again and he bombarded the city for 24 hours, causing massive damage and killing 600 people. And thus started the, uh, the war between Zamorin and, uh, sorry, uh, Calicut and, um, and Portugal. When he arrived back in, um, in uh, Lisbon, um, even though he discovered uh, Brazil even, and established that, claimed that for Portugal, even though he'd brought back a lot of spices, this mission was seen as a complete failure because not only had he not uh, established a trading treaty with the Zamorin of Calicut, he started a war with Calicut. So he wasn't held in very high regard. So on the 12th of February 1502, Vasco da Gama was given command of the 4th India Armada and with orders to seek revenge on Calicut and to establish, to bend them to their, uh, to the Portuguese will, to make them act on Portuguese terms. He left with 20 men, sorry, 20 ships and 800 men and they were all soldiers. They weren't merchants at all because this wasn't going to be a trading mission. It was a military mission. And he sailed around the Cape of Good Hope and went to a place called Kilwa. It was one of his first stops. And he went ashore there and he told the, the Emir of Kilmar that if you want peace with Portugal, you have to give us a tribute. The Emir wasn't used to this at all. He was used to getting a tribute from people who wanted to, to come to his region, not give a tribute. But the Gamma turned his guns on the city and threatened to destroy the city. So eventually the, um, the Emir did give him 1,500 piece gold pieces. And this was taken back to Lisbon and it was made into, crafted into what's known as the Custodia de Bellum, which is one of the great art treasures of, uh, of the Portuguese empire. And you can go and see it at uh, a museum in, in Lisbon. And then he went to um, a muck. He ran a muck in the Indian Ocean, uh, destroying, capturing, and destroying any Muslim ships he came across. He sunk everything he possibly could. But by far the most infamous and notorious event took place when with the pilgrim ship the Miri. This was a pilgrim ship that was uh, taking uh, pilgrims from uh, Calicut to Mecca to pray, to have their, their annual pilgrimage. And these were very, very rich people. He attacked the ship, boarded it, took everything of value on board, and then he locked the 400 people below decks. Now, 50 of these people were women, and there was an unknown number of children and babies on board as well. And he then start, set the ship on fire. He bombarded the ship with uh, his uh, uh, cannon, and but the ship took three days to sink. And it, it was said that the Gamma would go on board and look in the hold as people, women, were holding up their babies, begging uh, to, be, to be saved, begging for some sort of mercy. But he showed absolutely no mercy at all. One of the, the Portuguese witnesses uh, to this was a man by the name of Tomé Lopez, and he was appalled at what had happened. He later reported that these very rich merchants had offered their wealth, which could ransom all of the Christian slaves in the kingdom of Fez if they would be spared but they weren't. Um, he then sailed on to Calicut and he demanded the expulsion of all Muslim merchants and that um, the kingdom of Calicut would only trade with, um, with the Portuguese. The Zamorin uh, needed to do something, so he sent down his high priest, his, his best advisor, his most senior advisor, to try and talk to the Gamma and negotiate with him. But um, the Gamma thought he was a spy. He cut off his lips, he cut off his nose, he cut off his ears, and then he sewed dog's ears onto the side of his head, the high priest's head, and sent him back. 
and uh, to the Xamarin. And then he wrote the Portuguese equivalent of how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> Always wonder what happened to the dog. And what did the dog do wrong in all this? You know. um, and then he went to a nearby city of Cochin, which was a rival to Calicut. And he established a trading base there and decided this is where the, the Portuguese would operate from, from now on. He then um, went back to the African coast and established trading bases all along that African coast. Now, he knew that as he left, that um, there was going to be problems, that um, uh, Cochin was going to have problems with Calicut. So he left a man in charge of the garrison there. And this man was by the name of Dante Piera, who later became known as the Portuguese Achilles. He was an incredibly gifted warrior. And he was stuck there. Uh, he started life as, as a king squire. And he worked his way up through the ranks. He became a captain in the, the Portuguese fleet. He uh, was actually shipwrecked on the coast, the west coast of Africa. And it was Diaz when he did his first journey around that Cape, coming back from, from his first voyage of discovery, that discovered Pereira uh, and his other men shipwrecked on this beach and was able to rescue him and take him back to Lisbon. But Pereira was given command of Cochin, and he was able to hold the city for four months between March and July of 1504. He had 150 Portuguese soldiers and about 6,000 local militia, but he was up against 60,000 of the Zamorin's troops. He had three ships, but the Zamorin had 160 ships. And it was just by sheer brilliant tactics, incredibly brilliant tactics, a lot of personal bravery and a lot of luck that he was able to hold that city for that four months, keeping the Zamorin at bay, causing huge casualties to the, um, the forces of Calicut, who eventually decided this just wasn't worth it, and they retreated and went back to Calicut. Um, Piera became the very first person to uh, document that chimpanzees were intelligent and that they could create their own tools and use those tools uh, for hunting and for food, creating food. He, uh, because of the times, he never actually documented that uh, he thought that we may be uh, descendants of chimpanzees because that just wasn't done at that sort of that era, but uh, he hints to it in his writings. He then went on to discover the... the um, the relationship between the, the tides and the moon. And he wrote timetables, what we now know as tide tables, for all the regions that the Portuguese operated in, the very first timetables. He created new navigational equipment. And his mathematical ability was so great that he created these, he improved what we now know about the, the arcs of meridian. And what he did could not be improved on for another 200 years. So an incredible guy. And um, it was said by mathematicians that his genius was comparable to da Vinci. Now, the war between the, um, the uh, Portuguese and, and the um, Zamorins went on for more than 10 years. There was lots of atrocities between the two sides. It went on for ages. But it all came to a head in what is described as one of the greatest and most important sea battles of all time. If you see a list of the top 10 of the most important sea battles, the Battle of Jew is, is amongst those sea battles. It occurred on the 3rd of February, 1509, where a Portuguese fleet went up against the combined fleet of the um, Sultan of Durigat, the, um, the Sultanate of Egypt, the Zamorin of Calicut, uh, with financial and military support from the merchants of Venice, who had, had, whose trade had been decimated by the Portuguese. Um, and this battle took place, uh, as I said, on the 3rd of February. The Portuguese were well and truly outnumbered, but they had superior firepower and superior training, and they easily defeated the other navies. And uh, from then on, they took com complete control of the Indian Ocean. Um, they destroyed the, the, uh, the opposition fleet. They killed tens of thousands of men. They captured 3,000 men, but every one of those men was put to death. If you were lucky, you were hung. If you weren't so lucky, you were burnt to death. If you were really, really unlucky, you were tied to the front of a cannon and you were obliterated when the cannon were, were set off. So that was the way they were treated. And the Portuguese could control the spice trade for the next 100 years. If you wanted to operate, if, if we were this ship back in those days, operating in the Indian Ocean, we would have to have a Cartes license. This was a license that every ship needed. It was a license from the Portuguese. If you were found without a, a Cartes, you, your ship, your, um, your cargo would be forfeited, your ship would be forfeited, and your life could be forfeited as well. 
It was that important. You couldn't operate without one. And you could only get one of these licenses in one of the Portuguese trading ports along the coast of Africa or India. And um, which meant that you had to trade in those ports as well. You had to pay port charges in those ports. And so it was a great advantage to the Portuguese and made them a lot of money. And um, a great historian once said about the Battle of Jew, when the 15th century began, Islam seemed ready to dominate the world. But that, all, that prospect sank off in the Indian Ocean off Jew. And uh, since the Battle of Jew, uh, the European has dominated, Europeans have dominated the Indian Ocean and that trade. First of all with the Portuguese and then later on the Dutch, the English and the French established colonies in the region up until uh, World War II. Now, because of what he'd done, because of the tactics he had used, including the, the sinking of the, the Miri, um, when um, de Gama got back to Portugal, he was very much out of favour for two decades. And the kings of that period preferred other great explorers like Albuquerque and, and others. And they went off on, on voyages of exploration. But in 1518, the, great, uh, the other great Portuguese navigator, Magellan, uh, defected to the Spanish. And there was talk that de Gama was also unhappy and that he intended to defect as well. Now, it would have been disastrous for the king, would have been a publicity nightmare for the king uh, if his admiral of the Indies was going to defect to the Spanish. So um, he was actually promoted um, to admiral of the Indies and he was made a count of Vidigera, which was his local uh, region. And he was the first Portuguese count not born of royal blood and after that he always signed his name the Admiral Count. In 1521, King John III came to power and de Gama was able to come out of the political wilderness. Um, King John III preferred de Gama to others. And he was uh, given a, a great mission. The Spanish by this stage were defying the Treaty of Tordesillas. They were trying to establish bases themselves in the Indian Ocean. So de Gama was promoted to uh, Viceroy of India. And he set out in, in uh, February um, 1524 to try and curb the Spanish threat to the region, but also to try and sort things out in India because there was been a lot of corruption, a lot of incompetence, a lot, uh, things weren't going right, things weren't uh, operating as smoothly as they should have. So he arrived there in April 1524 and established a new order. He put his people in charge and things started getting better, but he died of malaria on Christmas Eve on 1524. He was originally interned in uh, St. Francis Church in Kochi in India, but in 1539 he was returned to uh, Portugal and re-interned in, um, in a diamond and jewel encrusted casket in uh, the city of Vidigera where uh, he came from. But um, three, and a half, well, three and a half centuries later he was re-interned in what we now know as Geronius Monastery in, uh, in Lisbon. You can go along there today and see his, uh, his casket there. And it's only metres away from the kings that he served during his time um, as an as a as a explorer. If you um, go to Lisbon, I, some of you will probably have already seen this. This is the Monument to the Discoveries, which is a, a fantastic monument near where cruise ships berth. This is the place where de Gama and his crew, his, his men sailed from, from uh, to the... Uh, to the India, and you can see in the background the, the Vasco da Gama bridge in the background. And the person right out the front, leading the way, showing the way for all the other great explorers is none other than Henry the Navigator, and behind him Vasco da Gama, along with all the other great Portuguese navigators in that, uh, that uh, period of discovery for Portugal. The, um, the port city in, in India, Vasco da Gama, is named in his honour there's three football teams in Brazil named in his honour. I don't know how they play against each other. Uh, a class of warship in Portugal is named Vasco da Gama class. Um, there's obviously the, the Portuguese national poem, the Lusiad, is all based on da Gama's uh, voyages of discovery to India. And as I said, that's the national poem of Portugal. There's lots of coins and books and operas and, and films all made about da Gama. A lot of them not painting him in a, a very good light at all. And as I said, the Vasco da Gama Bridge, which is the second longest bridge in Europe, about uh, 12 and a half kilometres long, is also named in his honour. And in his hometown, in Senez, in, uh, in Portugal, 
There's a great statue there that shows the gamma looking out over the ocean that he dominated for so long. So ladies and gentlemen, that's the story of, of Vasco da Gama. I hope you've uh, learned something by it and enjoyed yourself. Um, hopefully we'll see you around the ship in the next few days if uh, uh, things settle down. But in the meantime, have fun.